Good morning, welcome to our Sunday service and an especially warm welcome if it's your first time with us. It's great to have you worshipping online with us today. Psalm 99 begins, the Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. It's a reminder that our God, as well as being loving, is also awesome, powerful. So as we worship together this morning, may you know something of that power as you encounter the Lord who reigns. But first, a few notices. And if you'd like more information about what's going on in our churches this week, do please go to our website, calendar page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash calendar. And you can also sign up for our newsletter on the front page of the website, which means you'll get a message each week from us telling you what's going on. And secondly, let me say something about our online collection. Many of you already give regularly to our churches, and we're enormously grateful for that. But if you don't, and you'd like to help us with the cost of our work in the community, with maintaining our buildings, with sharing the gospel with people, then please do visit our online giving page for more information, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving. You can find the details of all our treasurers there as well if you've got any queries or questions you'd like to ask them. Thank you. Shall we be quiet then for a moment? And then we'll begin. O oh Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts and triumph over the shades of night. O oh come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Well, we're going to carry on blessing the Lord now as we sing our opening hymn. Why don't you stand for this?
Well, do please take a seat. Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from sin and turn back to the Lord, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And why don't we have a moment of quiet as we draw them to mind, and then we'll pray together. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And may Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, our psalm this morning is Psalm 77. It's a, a prayer inviting us to transform sorrow into joy by gazing upon the Lord. I'll say the odd number of verses. Why don't you respond with the even? So then, Psalm 77. I cry aloud to God. I cry aloud to God and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I have sought the Lord. By night, my hand is stretched out and does not tire. My soul refuses comfort. I think upon God and I groan. I ponder and my spirit faints. You will not let my eyelids close. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old. I remember the years long past. I commune with my heart in the night. My spirit searches for understanding. Will the Lord cast us off forever? Will he no more show us his favour? Has his loving mercy clean gone forever? Has his promise come to an end forevermore? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he shut up his compassion in displeasure? And I said, my grief is this, that the right hand of the Most High has lost its strength. I will remember the works of the Lord and call to mind your wonders of old time. I will meditate on all your works and ponder your mighty deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. Who is so great a God as our God? You are the God who works wonders and declared your power among the peoples. With a mighty arm you redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God, the waters saw you and were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies thundered. Your arrows flashed on every side. The voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Your lightnings lit up the ground. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea, and your paths in the great waters, but your footsteps were not known. You led your people like sheep by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Shall we pray? God, our shepherd, you led us and saved us in times of old. Do not forget your people in their troubles, but raise up your power to sustain the poor and helpless for the honour of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now shall we have our first Bible reading. The reading from Romans. <clears throat> there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
But those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his Spirit that dwells in you. Here ends the epistle. Well, thanks for reading that. We're going to respond to those words in worship now as we stand, if we wish, and sing our second song.
Well, do please take a seat. I'm not preaching for you this weekend. So before we hand over to our guest preacher, here's our second reading. The Holy Gospel is written in the 13th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the first verse. Glory be to thee, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no roots, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. We continue the reading a few verses later as Jesus explains the parable. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace said. The parable that Barry has just read for us is often used at harvest festival services and last year at Earl's Croom was one of those events. <clears throat> However, I'm not going to repeat the rap poem about the sower of the year, which was great fun for the children of all ages who listened to this amusing rendition of the story. I'm sure you would all enjoy it as well, but as a gathering of mature Christians, spiritually speaking, as well as in years, I'd like to draw your attention to the meaning of the parable as Jesus explained it to his disciples. <clears throat> now, the popular interpretation focuses mainly on the profligate scattering of the seed as an example of God's bountiful, unconditional love for all of humanity, whether accept that gift or not. I imagine that those who heard Jesus telling this parable would have found it, well, really quite puzzling. Many of them would have been farmers or part of a farming tradition. They would have known famine and shortage and would know that a sensible farmer doesn't just fling the seeds all over the place. They would know that the ground would have been prepared as well as possible in advance, precisely so that the seeds don't fall on rocky ground or among the thorns on the wayside. <clears throat> so, we need to look more closely at Jesus' explanation. And if we do, we can see that it's really the sower who is the key to an understanding of the meaning of the story. It's the sower who starts the story and the explanation that's given to those who are going to be sowers. And that, of course, includes all of us here. 
Jesus is, we are after, all, are after all Jesus' present day disciples. And God is, of course, the primary sower. But the disciples then, as now, are those who have accepted his call to follow him and to spread the word. Now, once you've changed your focus in this way, it becomes clear what our calling as disciples is to be. We are to join Jesus in spreading the word far and wide. And this means that we have to follow the example that he gives. You may remember that this includes making sure that the soil is prepared and that birds are scared away, that thorns are pulled up and that the seed doesn't fall where there's not enough soil to allow it to grow. Those of you who grow garden flowers and vegetables from seed will understand the wisdom of this advice. But how should we interpret that as an explanation of our mission as Jesus' disciples? <clears throat> well, I'm sure we would all have varying ways of putting this into practice, but let me offer you a couple of suggestions. First, we need to be aware of who we're talking to or who hears us when we talk about our faith, however trivial such comments or references might be. <coughs> Do our potential listeners understand our churchy language? Those who don't go to church or have no background of faith may feel we live in a world that's alien to them and thus switch off. I think this is Jesus' equivalent of preparing the soil and seeing that the seed doesn't land on soil that's too thin to allow it to grow. And the second point, Jesus talks about pulling up the thorns and scaring the birds away. I would see this as making sure that those who hear us are not seduced by stereotypes of Christianity. You know the sort that I mean, that we're holier than thou and think we're saintly people. I often remind people that we're just a bunch of, just bunch of redeemed sinners, no better or worse than our average person. But the crucial difference is, of course, that as St Paul points out in that letter to the Romans, when we turn to God to ask for forgiveness for our shortcomings, we know from Jesus' sacrifice on the cross that our loving God forgives us. And as St Paul says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We know from tales of Jesus' ministry, that it's those who are trying to be righteous who find it hardest to accept that forgiveness. And there's more that we can learn from St Paul in the passage from the epistle that we've just heard when he reminds us that if Christ is in you, the Spirit is alive because of his righteousness. So although it may seem crazy that God chooses to involve us in his mission, and gives us a real and awful responsibility. And I know this is something that often terrifies me and may even surprise you. But nonetheless, this is our calling. And with the task comes the power through the Holy Spirit to achieve it. <clears throat> so, what must we aspiring sowers do? Well, Prepare the ground as much as we can, but then trust in the generous mercy of God. And sometimes, sometimes, throw caution to the wind and watch with delight as God's word accomplishes what we could never have even dreamt of. So, let's wake up the Holy Spirit that was implanted in us at our baptism. Pray like crazy and see what our good Lord can achieve. And amen to that. Well, let's respond to what God has been saying to us through his word and through the sermon by standing, if you wish, and we'll sing our next hymn. Oh, church, rise and
put your armor on, hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength of God as given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's So cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. I call to war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captain. The Son of God is free. And see his foes like crushed beneath his feet. For the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, the Christ in heaven is gone. His spirit's in heart continues till the day. And as we stand, let's declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, do please take a seat. We're going to turn to prayer now. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Today we pray for everyone who organises, leads or assists with church activities. We remember first of all our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Grant them your protection and guidance. Bless their witness. Uphold them in your love and provide for all their needs. And we ask you to continue to support the work of Barry and our ministry teams. Please help us all to be patient, kind and faithful, that by our example other people may come to experience God's love and your church will grow in the power of your Holy Spirit. Strengthen our bishops John and Martin 
and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all people suffering from the ravages of war, conflict and civil unrest, for those injured, traumatised and displaced. We remember especially the people of Ukraine, Yemen, Myanmar and so many other places across the world. We pray for peace, for government which cares for those in need and seeks the paths of righteousness. We pray for your mercy on those who are hungry, homeless, lack access to medical facilities or are subject to exploitation. Help us to do whatever we can, however small, to show your care for them. And as we see the increasing effects of climate change, we pray that governments, corporations and we as individuals will take steps to reverse the bad practices which have destroyed the temperature balance. Please help those facing fires, floods and extreme weather. In particular, we pray for protection for the emergency services facing danger as they go to help others. May we all do what we can to preserve our planet's precious resources. Help all those in authority and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and peace that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you all those known to us who are suffering in mind, body and spirit and any who are in special need of your care. Thinking today of Vanessa Godfrey, Barry Smith, Andrew Hebden and any others known to us. Grant them comfort and healing and give strength, wisdom and skill to all the doctors, nurses, care workers, clergy and any others who minister to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you all those who've recently been bereaved, thinking today of the family and friends of Rosemary Harris and any others known to us. May those for whom this earthly life is over rest in your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our wider community. We pray for all those who are travelling at this time. We pray for students, teachers and everyone having holidays during this summer. May they travel safely and return refreshed and renewed. Dear Lord, as we go about our daily lives, help us to grow in faith. Hold a light before us when we feel discouraged, so that we can go forward with confidence and joy. Give grace to us, to our families and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ in one another, and love as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all your saints who have gone before us, we commend ourselves and the whole creation to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And let's continue in prayer with the Church's special prayer for today. And why don't we say these words together? Almighty Lord and everlasting God, we beseech you to direct, sanctify and govern both our hearts and bodies, in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that through your most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, before we have our final song, here's a short video. The good news of Jesus Christ is at the very heart of the Bible. It's at the very heart of everything we do on Truth For Life. And so we're always glad when people come to us with a very simple question, namely, 
What is this good news? What is the gospel? And in short order, we could say that the gospel is the announcement of what God, that is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, have done in and through the Lord Jesus in order that we might uh, come to know him and live with him and live for him. Uh, you know, the old Scottish Catechism asked the question, what is the chief end of man? Or why are we even here? And the answer that is given there is that uh, we exist in order to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Well, of course, that's a long way removed from where most of us are. And many times when I'm in front of people, I can see in their eyes that they're essentially not buying what's being said. Uh, this notion of Jesus on a cross just appears to them to be a sort of human tragedy. They may even feel good about feeling bad. They don't realize that in the cross, what we're dealing with is God's key to a divine strategy, that he sent his son, Jesus, to become one of us. And Jesus lived the life that we should live but can't. And then he died the death that we deserve to die. And he did it in our place. He did it voluntarily. And it is a wonder. It's about love. It's an immensity of God's love. When John writes about it, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so when a person comes to terms with this, then it becomes immediately apparent that any notion of acceptance with God on the basis of my religious background or the good deeds that I've done or the ones that I'm planning to do, a sort of grading on the curve approach of things, that uh, a good God, if he exists, will reward nice people if they do their best. All of that just comes crashing down before the historical reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Because now we're left face to face with his claim to be the Savior. You know, it was a Scotsman who came up with penicillin. If Alexander Fleming had not come up with penicillin, probably somebody else would have come up with it. But if Jesus Christ had not come, nobody else could come. Jesus is the only Savior because Jesus is the only one who is qualified to save. And so when that begins to dawn on us and we realize that the New Testament is always calling for a decision on our part, is identifying as, as being alienated from God and calling for us to understand what it means to be reconciled to him. And you may find yourself saying, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, I, I, I'm a simple soul and I just try it like this. First of all, A, that there's something to admit, and that is that I am in the wrong with God, that I have sinned against his law. Goodness, I, if I had a lifetime, I could never repay these things. So I admit that. Uh, I believe then uh, that Jesus has died in order that he might bear the punishment for my sins, that by his death and my trusting in his death, then the, uh, the guilt that is a real guilt is relieved once and for all. And by trusting in Jesus in the fact that he is a resurrected, that he's a risen Lord, then I can know his presence with me and his power in me. And then I like to say to people, but don't rush into this. Think about it. Consider these things. Consider the implications. It's a bit like getting married. You know, you'll never be the same again. And uh, it's going to involve saying no to sin, obviously. Saying no to my own selfish agendas. And uh, saying no to secrecy. It'd be strange to fall in love with somebody and not want anyone to know. And becoming a Christian is not some sort of mechanical transaction, some sort of mathematical formula. It is the dramatic reality of realizing this is why I was even made. And the God who made me has come and pursued me in Jesus and wants to woo me and win me for himself. You say, well, fair enough, but then what? Well, then simply throw yourself onto him. Speak to him. No special language necessary. You could even pray a prayer along these lines. Uh, Dear God, thank you for sending your son to do for me what I could never do for myself. I admit that I am sinful. I believe that Jesus died in the place of the sinner. I come with empty hands and with a needy heart 
and I ask you to transform my life and make me the person you want me to be. Now, if you are there at that point, then welcome. Because in, that, in the simplicity of that transaction, the promise of the Bible is that whoever comes to me, I will never turn away. You don't come on the basis of your background or your ability with the English language or whether the prayer was right or not, but with the awareness of the fact, as John Newton put it, I know two things. I'm a great sinner, and Jesus Christ is a great Savior. Perhaps today, God will use even this in order to bring about that divine transaction in your life. And if that is so, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you so that we could pray for you so that we could also send to you literature that will be helpful to you, so that we can encourage you in relationship to what it would mean to be with others who are now like-minded in that way, so that you have a family, so that you have friends, so that you have support. So thank you for the opportunity to say these things to you, and uh, do be in touch with us and be assured of our prayers. Thank you. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org. And why don't we stand now, if you wish, and we'll sing our final song together.
Well, do please take a seat. And thank you for joining us for worship today. Do invite others to join us as we gather online and in person week by week. If this has been your first time with us, I hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be here same time next week. And if there's any way we can help you in your spiritual journey in the meantime, do get in touch with me, Barry, at hopechurchfamily.org. Finally, we love to give this service away as a free gift to you, but if you are able to help support our costs and our work, the cost of this service and all that we do in the community, then please visit our website giving page, hopechurchfamily.org forward slash giving. And so may the Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we finish with the words of the grace? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.